In the next couple of videos, I'll be talking about artificial neural networks, also known under the name multi-layer perceptrons. We'll start off by interpreting neural networks as functions that compute feature vectors, uh, which are subsequently used for classification or for regression. Now, recall that so far we have computed feature vectors from our inputs via fixed basis functions. In the next videos, I'll show that we can actually learn such basis functions via neural networks. Now, in this video, I'll first explain what neural networks are and how they relate to these basis functions. And then in the next video, we'll go over some examples in the, const uh, in the context of function approximation. Now let's start by recalling how we were dealing with basis functions uh, so far. So the setting was uh, always we are provided with some data set and targets and then we want to solve some problem with it. And um, our data points were always considered uh, to be vectors in some d-dimensional uh, vector space. And then what we often did was uh, we first computed uh, feature vex vectors given my input. So my inputs were transformed to a new space uses, using basis functions. And we can use the basis functions such that eventually a regression or classification problem becomes easier. And so far we really um, picked these basis functions ourselves. Just by inspecting the data we thought that maybe Gaussian Bayesian functions or maybe polynomials of a certain order uh, would be useful to, to solve a problem with. Um, okay, another thing is we typically use uh, set the, the, the zero basis function to one because that in allows us to incorporate um, the bias in our models uh, by just uh, considering functions of the form so linear functions in the regression case, for example, just taking the scalar product of my basis functions or my basis feature vectors with a set of weights. So then I obtain a linear model, a linear function of W, but it's a nonlinear mapping because I first pulled this X uh, through my uh, basis functions. Okay, and then for linear regression, um, we uh, were working with targets that could take on any uh, value on the real line. So it was a continuous fitting uh, problem. Uh, so we do not work with any activation function. We just work with this linear model. Now in the classification setting, our targets uh, took on binary values. So they could either be zero or one. Uh, so we had to work with a, a, a nonlinear activation function that basically ensures that we have this uh, property. And then we come up, can come up with uh, proper um, classification frameworks and optimization schemes. Um, for, for example, for binary targets, uh, an optimal approach uh, was proven to be logistic regression, in which case we still have this linear component over here. So that actually leads to linear decision boundaries in the end. Uh, but we have this nonlinear function over here. So this nonlinear activation function. So for classification, we considered so far generalized linear models. So a linear component, linear in W. Uh, but overall nonlinear because we have this uh, uh, activation function. Okay, so that's what we've seen so far. And I also said that uh, maybe we also want to learn the basis functions ourselves because now we're hand designing them. We made choices there and uh, for low dimensional cases, we could still do it, but for higher dimensional cases, it's very hard to come up with a proper choice for basis functions. So ideally we want to make this part of the learning uh, procedure and that's uh, precisely uh, what we're going to do uh, when we optimize neural networks. Okay, now let me remind us again that uh, for convenience, we will work with uh, feature vectors which have like a constant one as the first component and then uh, the original data points, the original vector. So we prepend our data vectors with a one such that we can include the bias uh, the bias parameter inside uh, the set of weights that we're going to consider. Okay, and now we take on the viewpoint on neural networks as uh, functions that work with adaptive basis functions to compute the feature vectors. Uh, so these feature vectors are then later used for uh, regression or for classification. Uh, but the learning of this basis function uh, will be part of the learning process itself. And these particular basis functions will be parameterized via generalized linear models. And this means that each uh, basis function takes on the following form, right? So the basis function is a function of x and it is parameterized by its own set of uh, parameters w. And, it's, and so this basis function is defined in the following way. So it says linear mapping 
um, followed by some nonlinear activation function. So this part is just a linear model and this part is a nonlinear function mapping, nonlinear, uh, what we call an activation function. So to make this a little bit more explicit, our uh, linear part really consists of taking a linear combination of my input values uh, weighted with the corresponding uh, well, weight values. And these Ws, those are parameters that now become part of, of the learning procedure. And once we've linearly transformed our inputs, uh, we pull it through this uh, activation function. So we see that each basis function um, is now defined by some generalized linear model. Okay, and now we have defined our basis functions, which are parameterized uh, by a set of uh, weights W, which we are now also going to learn. Okay, but now we have these basis functions and we want to solve problems with it. And we're doing this just like we've been doing uh, so far. So for the regression case, we just work with a linear model. So a linear model uh, applied to uh, my feature vectors. And these are my now computed feature vectors. And I'm going to take linear combinations of this to make a prediction for Y. So let me write this out. So this looks like my linear model at the scalar product with my new feature vector. Um, my new feature vector, I can write it in this way, W1 transpose X. And you see, I'm now indexing uh, the set of weights, right? Because this uh, set of parameters is associated with my first step of transformation. So uh, used in my basis functions. And then the second set of, of weights is used in my output layer that these contribute to my final output prediction. And what I did over here, I defined this matrix. So this a big W1 to be, um, well, the collection of all my basis function um, vectors, right? So if I put them all next to each other, so let me do that. So each, a uh, basis function had its own set of uh, uh, linear parameters w, and if I put them next to each other, then I can obtain the predictions or the feature values for each m uh, in one go via this matrix vector multiplication, where each time I multiply uh, the weights of basis function one with my input, and then of two with my input, and that gives me this column vector, this column vector of uh, new feature values, which are then pulled through this activation function. So. This thing over here is what we've been um, used to seeing like this. So a vector of uh, feature values obtained uh, from some basis function, but now the basis function is learned. And then we obtain our regression model as a linear model. So uh, this scalar product of my model parameters W with this learned uh, basis function. So really a regression uh, problem can be formulated as a as a two-layer neural network in that sense. So we have a first layer that computes the feature vectors, and then we have a final layer that uh, contributes to my uh, prediction. Now, similarly, we can uh, use these learned basis functions um, to, to solve classification problems. And in that uh, setting, we work with generalized linear models, uh, but now it's a generalized linear model um, using my learned uh, feature vectors. So my feature vectors were obtained via this uh, weight matrix uh, one with my feature vector X. Where again, in this matrix vector multiplication, I multiply the set, the set of weights for each basis function with the input, the next basis function uh, for this input, and then pull it through this activation function. So again, this thing over here gives me my learned uh, feature vector. And then in a classification setting, we use this activation function, we use the logistic sigmoid, or in the multi-class uh, classification case, we worked with a softmax function to turn uh, these values into probabilities. Okay, so what I just uh, showed essentially defines two layer neural networks. And in the upcoming slides, I'll, I'll show some examples of deeper uh, neural networks. Uh, but these are just uh, two layer neural networks and we gave them the interpretation of uh, basically working with learned basis uh, vectors, basis functions. Okay, so that defines a two layer neural network and in, as a model, as a mathematical model is given as follows. Uh, but 
we are also going to get used to these network diagrams. This is what you typically see when people explain how they design the neural networks to, to others. They work with these kind of visualizations because those are often more uh, easily, easier to interpret than these equations. And I'll show some example later on where this definitely is the case. So let's go over the components of multi-layer perceptrons of neural networks. So first of all, we have the input units. Um, so we have an input vector X, um, which is prepended with a one. So we have X1 up to XD. And each of these components is called an input unit. So each such value is represented with one of such uh, dots over here. So I have a D dimensional a d plus one dimensional input because I prepended a one and then each input unit is represented as one dot. So this dot, you should really think of it as taking on just one real number, right? It's, it's one of these components within my vector. Then we have what we call activations denoted with a and they're also indexed uh, with some index m in this case. So this a is a vector of activation, so A1 up to AM. And this uh, vector is obtained by this matrix vector multiplication, right? My first uh, model parameters W uh, times X. And this gives me an M dimensional feature vector, though it's not yet the final feature vector because this is just a linear part. And we first have to pull it through this a nonlinear activation function to, to turn this into uh, what we refer to as the basis uh, function feature vectors uh, so far. Okay, but before we get there, um, we do this linear mapping and this leads to what we call the activations. So let's draw that over here in yellow. Then we have what we call hidden units denoted with Z and also with the same index M because these ZMs, those are the feature vectors obtained from the activations by really activating them with the corresponding activation function. Okay, so we have all these hidden units, set M, and they're obtained by applying this activation function. So by applying the activation function H to A, and that gives me the corresponding uh, hidden unit. And these hidden units will in turn be used as inputs for the next layer, right? So these hidden units are the feature vectors at that point used to well, obtain my new feature values uh, using this linear uh, uh, combination of the hidden units. But we're considering here uh, the two layer uh, neural network. So my next layer would be then uh, my output layer and the units or the values at the output are called the output units. And these output units are typically denoted with Y with a particular index K. So this is the K output unit. And these output units, as said before, form this vector of outputs, a y1 to yk. And these are obtained with my second uh, linear mapping, with my second set of weights from uh, my hidden units. And this would then give me my k dimensional uh, output vector. Okay, so each value in this output vector correspond to one of such nodes and it's called an output unit. So this would be my k output value. It's just a number, it's just a real number. So this is just a reminder at each node we should think that it, we place some real value, right? And we call each of these values, we call them well units. So we have an input unit x, uh, we have a hidden unit set m and we have an output unit uh, yk. And then finally, we work with these uh, activation units. So each layer has its own activation unit, uh, but typically we just say we use one unit throughout my network, except maybe for the output where we may maybe make specific choices uh, that depend on the problem, right? In linear regression, maybe you do not want to have any output uh, activation, uh, but for logistic regression or for classification, you maybe want to apply a logistic sigmoid or a soft max to the output layer. Uh, but generally we say, uh, we stick with one choice for um, activation function that turns my activations into the hidden units. Okay, so these are all the components of a multi-layer perceptron of a two-layer neural network in this particular case. Uh, now it's only two layers. So we start off with 
an input unit. So that's all those uh, input values, XD. Those are transformed linearly via my weights uh, in the first layer to give me the activations, to give me the activations of the first layer. And these activations are in turn, in turn turned into um, hidden units, the set amps by applying this activation function H to my uh, activations. And then those uh, hidden units uh, are used as inputs for the next linear model. So that's why we apply this W now here that gives me all these uh, output units. And then we can decide to apply uh, another activation units to my, uh, an activation to my outputs. So we have inputs X, we have this matrix factor multiplication with my first set of, of weights, uh, W1, that gives me in the end the activations, and then it gives me the, the hidden unit, so this hidden unit factor uh, set, which is then transformed by a linear a transformation with my set of parameters uh, W2, and that gives me my output activations. Okay, so uh, that explains all the components. Now let's just take a quick look at choices that we have for the activation functions. Um, what is listed here are some popular choices for activation functions. Um, the logistic sigmoid, that's classically uh, one that is used a lot in neural networks. Um, we, for now, used it uh, only for the, the output layers uh, to turn a problem into a logistic regression problem or a classification problem. We worked, we, we already saw this uh, logistic uh, sigmoid before. So this is the logistic sigmoid. And it's drawn over here as this green line, right? So it, it squashes all the values um, of my linear model to the range uh, 0, 1. And that allows us to interpret things as uh, probabilities, uh, essentially. Then what we see in red is the hyperbolic tangent. So the hyperbolic tangent, which is given by e to the power x minus e to the power minus x divided by e to the power x plus e to the power minus x. Okay, that's indicated here in red. Um, it also has this nice uh, squashing property, but now it, it squashes all the, uh, the values between the values minus one and plus one. And it has this sort of linear uh, part over here. So close to, to zero, this function is, is linear. Uh, but if my uh, activations take on very high values, uh, then those get uh, truncated at the value one, essentially. So those two are classically quite popular choices, uh, but it turned out that if you go uh, deeper into your networks, then uh, these activation functions aren't actually uh, so nice to work with. And this has to do that with the fact that uh, when we optimize these models, we have to compute the gradients. That, that, that is what we have seen also in the other models. We apply gradient descent uh, type of methods and apply chain rules. And now if you pull things to such uh, activation functions, then you also need the derivative of these kind of things. And you see that both the logistic sigmoid and the hyperbolic tangent, they sort of flatten off uh, to some constant value. That also means that the derivatives at these locations will take on very small uh, values. And this leads to numerical instability in the end. And when we optimize neural networks with, uh, with such activation functions, and the type of activation function that doesn't suffer from this is the rectified linear uh, unit or ReLU. And that is given by the max of zero with A. So this function really is a linear model of A. So it has this linear part and everything below zero is just mapped to the value zero. So it's, it's just like a threshold uh, function. So this rectified linear unit the ReLU is by far uh, the most popular activation uh, function at the moment uh, uh, out there. And then I have a small but very important remark about working with activation functions. Um, because you could, maybe you're tempted to think, okay, why do we need activation functions? Things become much more simpler if we don't apply them. And the main reason actually is that it doesn't make sense if you build deep neural networks or neural networks without activation functions. Because if you do not apply an activation here, then I just concatenate linear operations one after each other. And a concatenation of linear operators in the end result in one netto uh, linear operator. So then you assign all these weights 
And in the end, uh, you could have done this directly with one uh, linear model. Um, so in order to make things uh, complex and interesting, we do need activation functions. Otherwise, we just end up with some linear model. Okay, so let me just write that down over here such that we don't forget it. We need activation Okay, so don't forget about this. We do need activation functions, otherwise we're just learning uh, linear models. And then we don't need all this uh, complicated uh, structure over here. Now let's uh, familiarize ourselves a bit uh, further with neural networks by considering types of neural networks that we actually already saw throughout this course. First of all, we already worked uh, with one layer neural networks. So these are just linear models, uh, right? Or, or maybe generalized linear models. And we work with them in the linear regression case. So really what we did in the linear regression case, we said, okay, we want to predict our outputs or maybe the target means of my target distributions um, with a parameterization uh, factor W, just via this linear mapping from input to output Y. So that's essentially what you see over here. All the input units are multiplied with the corresponding weights and that gives me my output y. And in the regression case, we wanted to regress any value on the real line. Uh, so we do not apply any activation function, or in this case, the activation function is just the identity operator. Okay, so we already encountered uh, one layer neural networks. Uh, we also encountered them in the uh, classification case, where we were building classification models for each class uh, k. We wanted to predict some probability. And this probability was given by such a generalized linear model. So again, a linear uh, combination of the input. So each k output, each k class had its own set of weights, a w. And when dealing with k classes, we applied the softmax, the softmax uh, activation functions uh, to these activations, such that these outputs could be interpreted as the probability for class k given my input x. So that looks like this, right? So each output uh, prediction yk was obtained by a linear combination of my inputs. And then uh, we applied a soft max activation function uh, due to all these uh, output uh, predictions. So that describes a linear classification model uh, with k classes as a one layer neural network. So those are just one layer uh, neural networks. That's not super interesting, right? It's just regression or just uh, uh, classification via generalized linear models. So things become interesting when we go deeper. And what this essentially means is that we have all these uh, mappings, so a linear transformation followed via a nonlinear activation uh, function that gives me a new feature vector. Again, linear combination, activation function. So we apply all these mappings and you could think of it as in the end, ending up with a very complex uh, basis function as a function of x, right? This value is obtained via all these mappings. So it's a function of x in the end, where this basis function is then essentially parameterized by all the weights uh, before this. And then once we have obtained such a feature vector, uh, then these values can be used to make our final predictions to solve the problem that we were actually dealing with. And so this could be a multi a uh, multi-target regression problem, or it could be a multi-class classification problem, or whatever the problem is that, that you're working on, right? So we can build very deep neural networks, where deep means really uh, how many uh, layers you have. So a deeper, networks, a, a deeper network has a lot of layers. So we can es essentially now build very deep networks to come up with very uh, intricate, very complicated uh, feature vectors at this point. And this also exposes why we really like to work with such uh, diagrams, because if I write this out uh, as an equation, it looks something like this. So this equation corresponds to my diagram where we have these uh, inputs X. So those are my input units. Those are transformed via the weights in my first layer um, to the activations. So the activations of the first layer. And those activations are in turn transformed via uh, the activation functions into the corresponding hidden units. So each node, each value over here is called a hidden unit. Then uh, let me use a different color. Then uh, the next layer gives me the values of the next uh, hidden unit. And these hidden units are again used as input for the next layer. So a linear transformation followed uh, 
by this activation gives me uh, the, the activations and the hidden uh, units at layer 3, which is then again linearly transformed followed by a final activation and this gives me my uh, outputs uh, Y. So this is my neural network written out and it's nothing else as a, a stacking of linear layers, linear transformations followed by a pointwise nonlinear um, activation. And I'm just putting this out here as a reference. Uh, sometimes it's more convenient to work with this notation where this uh, O dot or this circle uh, denotes uh, function concatenation. So I'm concatenating a linear transformation with a nonlinear one followed by a linear by a nonlinear one. So this a circle means function concatenation. Um, yeah, okay, it's just for convenience sometimes uh, we write this, sometimes we write this, but quite often in this course, uh, we just show uh, the diagram and then uh, focus on specific parts of uh, my neural networks and write those out. Okay, and then it becomes easier to actually design such neural networks to be, become creative in how we uh, actually transform my inputs in the end to a particular uh, feature vector that, that is used for classification or regression. So we can allow for skip connections, for example. And these skip connections follow the same principle. So it means that each input unit can contribute to another uh, activation by just taking linear combinations of these uh, hidden or input units and they can skip a layer, which means in this case that uh, the activation of the units in this layer is formed by taking linear combinations of my uh, hidden units at the previous layer plus taking linear combinations of my inputs. And we could decide to give such a layer, such sets of weights, its own index uh, for I think we would still refer to this as a three layer neural networks because it has these, uh, as a function of depth, it has these three uh, trainable layers. Um, and this is what we call a skip connection. So this is what we refer to as a three layer neural network with skip connections. And sometimes we make these choices of skip connections because it is theoretically motivated. Um, and sometimes uh, we, we just do this uh, because we empirically found that it is useful to do uh, such a thing. Either way, we are allowed to be creative with how we design our neural networks. This also means that we can decide not to connect every node, every uh, unit with, uh, the, the, with all the units in the next layer. Uh, for example, here we omitted, we omitted, for example, this connection and this connection. So these connections are omitted. And this leads to what we call sparse neural networks. So sparse neural networks. And also this, this is a choice that we can make. And sometimes we make this choice because it's convenient because we don't have too much processing power and we want to sort of reduce the computational load. So we sort of uh, remove some connections uh, leading to a sparse neural network. Um, but sometimes we also want to impose a particular structure um, and we can do that by, well, selecting which uh, nodes connect to the other nodes. And this is particularly so the case when we talk about convolutional neural networks, um, which have additional weight sharing. So uh, apart from deciding where to place connections, we can also decide to assign the same weights to a particular set of connections. So in this example, for example, the, the blue uh, connections all have a weight one, the green connection all have a weight two, and the orange connections all have a weight tree. So this is what we call weight sharing, that there are multiple connections, multiple uh, weights that essentially have share the same weight. So this means that we can define convolutions also via neural networks, where we recognize maybe this convolutional structure here by moving this pattern of weights to the next node. So we see that at every feature vector is obtained via linear combination of a local uh, neighborhood, and this local neighborhood shifts. Now this convolutional structure is best explained with, uh, with an extra uh, visualization. Um, let's first of all start out by denoting such a linear mapping from input to the next activations uh, via matrix vector multiplication, right? So we have, uh, let, let this be our, uh, the, the vector of all my uh, input uh, units and let this be the vector of activations. 
Then each activation, for example, activation A1, is obtained by multiplying all these weights, so all the connections to A1 A1 uh, with um, well the input vector. So we have this uh, row vector uh, multiplication. And then in the next activation is obtained also uh, by this uh, row vector multiplication. So this entire stack of activation can be obtained by this big matrix. So you have all these weights that fully parameterize uh, basically all possible uh, linear maps from input to the next uh, uh, layer. And we're now going to turn this into a convolutional form. So um, convolutions are applied to structured data on functions on some axis. So now, for example, we consider a 1D signal. So it assigns for every time point on this axis. So let's just index it. So with a 1 to D. So I split this signal into D values. So each point on the signal represents one value x1. So let that be your input uh, unit, input vector. Now what a convolution does, uh, you apply this convolution kernel at every location. So we take a linear combination of my neighborhood values and that gives me the new value um, for my output vector, for my output signal. So let me write this out. So when we consider my output vector A to be obtained by this convolution or correlation actually uh, with a correlation kernel W, then the jade component of this output vector is obtained via sum over some neighborhood, let's denote it with y minus j, so uh, this distance smaller than k, so k is some kernel size, this is a smaller than. Okay, the sum of the values within this neighborhood uh, with a, a set of weights that are aligned with my data point i, so this is my shifted uh, convolution kernel uh, W. So this correlation or convolution looks like this. So I move my set of weights, my kernel around and every time I take this inner product I, pro I multiply this weights with my signal over there. So I have three weights over here and that gives me the signal at this point. Okay, so that's what's happening. In order to obtain the, the value for my output at this location I multiply this kernel, these weights with uh, the underlying input x for this uh, small neighborhood. Okay, so that's what you see over here, right? My first uh, output value, so somewhere over here, is obtained by multiplying these weights with the first couple of uh, input data points. Then I move to the next data point, uh, and then I shift my weights accordingly. And basically it means I multiply the rest with zeros. But then my output A2 is obtained via W1, W2, W3 times X2, X3, X4. So I shift my kernel uh, all the time and that's what you see in this uh, matrix. Okay, so what you see is that this uh, convolution operator uh, is essentially a matrix vector multiplication with an incredibly sparse matrix. So there's a lot of zeros, so that also means there's a lot of multiplication and computations that I do not need to perform. And then on top of that, we have weight sharing. So these weights are shared uh, over this diagonal uh, band, which corresponds to a shift um, uh, of, of, of my kernel. Okay, so this leads to an incredible reduction of uh, parameters that we need to train, uh, but maybe more importantly, it preserves the structure of my signal. If my input, uh, if my input represents some signal, then I want to preserve maybe this structure because I, well, uh, then I can apply this, this weight sharing. So convolutional neural networks are a specialized type of neural networks that are super efficient uh, with the parameters. And that also uh, contributes highly to the success of convolutional neural networks. Most applications nowadays are built on top of these uh, convolutional neural networks. So when we have such structured data structures, we do not want to uh, fully parameterize uh, my neural network, but only work with maybe a sparse set of connections plus weight sharing. Okay, enough about uh, convolutional neural networks. So in general, we have these feed forward architectures and we can be very creative in how we design this. Sometimes we want to design it because we want to preserve data structure, meaning that maybe we want to sparsify uh, our network and uh, uh, apply weight sharing. So we can decide not to connect every node to every other data point. We can also decide to put the same weights along several edges and we also may uh, decide to put uh, skip connections in our network. Okay, so anything is possible really as, as long as uh, you form these, uh, these units, 
these hidden units at some layer uh, exclusively by taking linear combinations of uh, units of lower layers. So really we want to preserve this feed forward uh, mechanism because once we start including uh, closed cycles, then we have uh, some dynamics that can become very unstable. And um, so generally that's not what you want and it becomes actually computationally impossible to, to work with this. So these ZJs can be any hidden unit from one of the lower, from one of the lower layers. So that wraps it up for uh, neural networks. So now we know what they look like, uh, what they are actually, and how to construct them. Um, so in the next videos, we're going to explore what we can actually do with neural networks.